Do you feel it's frustrating? Because when you talk about this, it, it's something that I, I've tried to explore in my own way, which is the big question around what human nature is. Uh, I find it such a big thing and so complex of a thing that it really to try to say that we're naturally warlike or we're naturally this or that. You know, people will often project what they see around them onto others and onto the past. And do you get a sense that that whole question is tainted by that, uh, by the kind of conditioned understandings that we have about what human nature is, that maybe we just have never seen what it's actually like to live in a partnership society. So we just imagine that those are myths or stories that are told. Um, Do you have, I guess, maybe more concrete examples of what a partnership society would look like, not only in the past, but also in the present? Well, let me first address the question that you bring up, uh, the story that we've been told about human nature, which, whether it's original sin, whether it's selfish genes, is the same story. Uh, We're bad, that's human nature, and therefore we have to be rigidly controlled from the top, right? Whether by God or by his so-called representatives here on earth or some dictator, some strong man, etc. Uh, and that is a very convenient story to impose and maintain domination systems. Now, my most recent book, uh, Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, which came out with Oxford University Press last year, uh, really addresses that question, among others, uh, and shows that, for one thing, uh, we're asking the wrong question. Uh, Human nature is not fixed. Um, We have the capacity for caring, for consciousness, for creativity, but we also have, obviously, capacities for insensitivity, cruelty, destructiveness, violence. The What we know today from neuroscience, and the academy is being very, very, very slow in incorporating this knowledge, and it, the academy is so siloed, the universities are so siloed, so fragmented, that it, well, maybe you have this information in a course on neuroscience or an occasional course on psychology, whereas it should be part of sociology, it should be part of political science, of economics, because what we today know is that this question of nature versus nurture is a really nonsensical question, because what we know from neuroscience is that nothing less than how our brains develop, how our brains develop, uh, is a function of the interaction of genes with our environment, especially during our first years of life, when we are even more malleable and more flexible. Um, These are the years when we know from the years from zero to three, 85% of brain structures are formed. So, and uh, what my work shows uh, is that neuroscience today supports the conclusion that how our brains, and hence how we feel, how we think, how we act, including how we vote and work and everything else, Uh, that these are very different depending on the degree to which our cultural environments orient to the partnership or domination side of the scale. Uh, In other words, as mediated, of course, by families, by education, by religion, politics, economics, and so forth. So that is really changing our story and nurturing our humanity and all my books, uh, starting with The Chalice and the Blade, which now, by the way, is in, um, what is it, 57 U.S. printings 
and 27 foreign editions, they tell a different story, a more accurate and realistic and inclusive story of our human adventure here on Earth. Okay, so this is fascinating to me, um, this idea of saying, okay, human nature is not fixed. So, in other words, the discussion of are we um, by nature dominating or focused on partnership is the wrong question. You're saying we have the capacities for both and that then our individual capacities are brought out depending on what culture that we're born into. And then most of that is set at an early age. So uh, from that standpoint, then um, as individuals, we need to understand how that process happened to ourself, I suppose, in order to break out of things that we need to break out of. Absolutely. And the good news is that actually, if you want to really look at what we're so called wired for, uh, we humans are, are in some very real uh, sense, uh, physiologically, biologically wired more for partnership rather than domination relations. However, uh, domination systems suppress those capacities. Uh, for example, I, I'll just give you one example uh, of, of a study that is uh, discussed in uh, Nurturing Our Humanity. Uh, we receive neurochemical rewards of pleasure, not only when we are cared for, but when we care for others, uh, whether it's a mate or a friend or a child, even a pet, right? We feel good. Uh, however, um, domination systems reward, reward, uh, and really make it seem normal, uh, as we see in, in some U.S. subcultures, uh, to think only in terms of in-group versus out-group terms. Uh, so that you may be kind to the people in your in-group, but the out-group, um, the other, is labeled as not only inferior, but dangerous. And this starts, and this is why I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the partnership domination scale does not marginalize the majority of humanity, women and children. It starts really with the model that we internalize uh, for gender. That's right, because we're so used to thinking of gender as, quote, just a women's issue, right? Which is kind of idiotic because women are half of humanity, more or less, uh, you know, I mean, making allowance for sexual orientations and whatever. Uh, but uh, what, what, what we miss here is that we humans really uh, have an enormous capacity uh, for caring. But when you are brought up with this model of our species where the difference in form between male and female is equated with either superiority or inferiority, with dominating or being dominated, with being served or serving, uh, children internalize a template for equating difference, whether it is based on race, whether it's based on religion, whether it's based on sexual orientation, with, uh, yeah, with superior, inferior, uh, and, and we have really internalized this to varying degrees, but it is particularly strong in cultures that orient to the domination side. As I said, whether they're Eastern or Western, Northern or Southern, religious or secular, a rightist or leftist. I mean, Stalin, for example, uh, when he came into power, he reversed what little had been done under Lenin uh, to 
equalize relations in families. Uh, you know, you, uh, you, abortion again became a very, you know, heinous crime, right? Uh, illegitimacy. I mean, all of a sudden, some children were considered illegitimate. How can a child be illegitimate? But a child's a child, right? But he wanted a return, as do the people pushing us back to the so-called traditional, which is a code for an authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, uh, highly punitive family. And the good news, however, is that even some people who are brought up in these families, if they just glimpse that there is another possibility, they reject that. That's the good news. The bad news is that a majority of people who are brought up in rigid domination families are very likely to uh, really even vote for strongman leaders and to think only in in-group versus out-group terms. Music